Hello. As promised in the title, I was thinking of doing some programming today. And what I'm gonna concentrate on. The app looks quite promising already, it's quite functional. I need to learn new stuff, mainly lists, and layouts, stuff like this. So I might be concentrating on that. On that. I don't know what else I can improve in my app without those skills, baby. I will show you in a moment how the app currently works. Got my tea. Oh, okay, how do we do that again? This one, right? Yes, my face is in the way, but currently the amount of code is like this. Everything in one file because I didn't learn how to refractor stuff yet, but like the next step, uh, tell much recommended. So we're gonna do that. Um, but that's probably today evening or later. We're gonna do that for now. How does it work? Yeah. loading so we have a nice looking board that's totally device dependent nice buttons that actually show dialogues apart from this button which is the hint button the give up button and you have the skip button once you skip a button, you can load a collection and it shows properly everything pieces in hand. This is on the board and you can click only the uh, black pieces. Uh, pieces in hand you cannot click currently because you have zero. And then from here you could give up or you can find the solution. Um, and then if I want to promote the bishop, it has to be legal move, right? This is what we worked on yesterday, that's a whole other story, but I could promote it out from the promotion zone, right? That's how Shaggy will work. And I could make that move, it doesn't allow me because it's the wrong move. It has no prompt showing that it is the wrong move. What I imagine is the most traditional boo-boo sound or something to indicate this is illegal. Perhaps this square shining red or something like that. Um, to indicate it's illegal, but for now it's just like ignoring you if it's uh, illegal move, the, uh, the wrong move. You cannot make illegal move legally. I mean, or illegal move, yeah. I mean, illegal move would be the wrong move. So yeah, generally the wrong move. Here, this is the correct move, so it promoted, yeah, it showed us. And now the problem we had yesterday is you could double click a piece and promote it in a place, which is funny. And you could unpromote them, so now it should be fixed. You see, it didn't ask me if I want to promote it again because it recognizes it's a horse and horse cannot promote. And as we, you see, yes, if I select a piece, it's purple. As I play the last move, that selection is turned off and those buttons get disabled. Those buttons get enabled and this button gets enabled, which is Kifu. It does exactly nothing for now because it requires for me to learn a list. But yeah, you can review the whole Kifu in case you had like a doubt about something, you can review it. I think in the next 
And then similarly, um, well, you can just skip it. We had a bug where you would select a piece, skip it, and the selection would linger, but it's not a thing anymore. Similarly, if I select a piece and give up, it turns off properly. And now, as you gave up, again, you cannot click it because in the view mode, let's call it, now we can view it. Solution. There is the problem that um, we don't have that function that's on PlayShare get it recognizes checkmate. Even if it's not part of the solution, it's only gonna accept one correct way to do a checkmate, which is sometimes frustrating. Yet, um, maybe I should add it to the list of things to improve. I have a whole notebook. Thanks to improve. Just to show you. <laughs> uh, that was just selection and this was the promotion. Yep. Um, what was it? Check for checkmate. We don't have... What I would like to do is, of course, uh, have indication that this is checkmate and we have function for that already just not implemented the king is gonna turn red on the background similar to Lee, Lee Shogi um, so that would indicate checkmate I would also like to do that there is an option in settings that if you select a piece it's gonna show you the movements of a piece or something like this it, this also we chose the green color it's not implemented I mean, it, it is implemented, it's just not connected to the code, kind of. <laughs> those are the small things. For promotion, I would also like to have a different promotion prompt. Um, wait, why the phone cannot promote? That's... That's a bug. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so this is tricky. The pawn can promote. But it doesn't ask you because the promotion is forced, actually, and ignores your input because it's illegal move. Okay. So it works as proper as it should. It just it doesn't give you feedback that it's the wrong move. Um, I was thinking it would be cool to be able to swipe top to promote and swipe down to unpromote. This is why I put it in the column. But I have no technical knowledge how to do it yet. Um... And yeah, that's what I planned for today, is like to learn exactly how I can do that. List will be also important for the settings. Need to learn how to make a new screen today. That's what I will concentrate on. But it's already quite um, addicting. Like, you can solve those problems, as you can see, quite easily. Like, everything seems to be working <laughs> if I play here king goes to the side what do I do then nothing I couldn't figure out just promote I guess I'm not sure. I can always come back and think about it. Yeah, we don't have the sub-variation thing. It's way too complex for now. Maybe the gold drop would work as well. There would be many solutions to the king would run. Anyway, that's the current state, yeah? Those buttons are not working. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of following this tutorial now. Um, trying to find the correct window. <laughs> All my windows says uh, Android. Okay. 
Um, it's a bit confusing sometimes. So basically, they have those units, and it doesn't let me sign in on all those pages at the same time. Uh, they have those units, and I wanted the start number three. This is four. This is three. It's three again. So they have to be open. Okay. And like I wanted to do the Kotlin fundamentals, scrollable list, and beautiful apps, followed by uh, navigation and different sizes. Those are those thing two things that we need. This we will need for settings page. This we will need for general usage. List we will need for Kifu. So this is why I need to learn it. Cannot go forward without learning those. May be boring to watch, but that's what I wanted to do today. For the decades, programmers devised several programming languages features to help you write better code, expressing the same idea with less code abstraction to express complex ideas, and writing code that prevents other developers from accidentally making mistakes. I just few examples. Yep, I cannot break too much code because it's in a library and it's abstract. The Kotlin language is no exception, and there are a number of features intended to help developers write more expressive code. Okay. Unfortunately, these features can be tricky if it's your first time programming. Yep, while it might sound useful, the extent of their usefulness and problems they solve may not always be apparent. I, I, I'm really impressed how well written this tutorial is. It's really the, what I feel. <laughs> Chances are we've already seen some features used in Compass and other libraries. Where there is no substitute for experience, this code lab exposes you to several Kotlin concepts that help you structure larger apps. So, okay, that's what we will need. We want larger app generics, okay? Different kinds of classes. Enum and data. Yeah, Telmarch recommended we create enum class yesterday because we have two variables called give up and is solution, and they work in similar manner of blocking the buttons. He was proposing to enclose them into same enum or something like that. For that data class, I guess. Singleton and companion objects. This sounds like portal to me. <laughs> With companion queue. Extension properties and functions. Scope functions. This tells me nothing. I guess there's a scope for a function. Extension properties. No idea. They extend some properties. By the end of this code lab, you have a you should have a deeper knowledge of the code you've already seen in this course and learn some examples of when you will encounter or use this concept in your own apps. I mean, if I understand this all, I would be impressed with my yes. Um, we need to know inheritance, which we did some part a while. Uh, interfaces we did by defining using the word by. Okay, what we're gonna learn. All those things, okay. But they said to use the... Oh, there's the wrong button. Use the web browser access to Kotlin Playground. We could do that. I think they changed it. It looked differently. What is it? Dark mode. <laughs> the last time I ran it, it was in dark mode. Okay, let's do this, maybe. Doesn't hide the screen, okay. Kinda hides it when I'm reading the text. Hmm. Yeah, for reading, let's put it here. Make a reusable class with generics, okay? Let's say you're writing an app for an online quiz, similar to the quizzes you've seen in this course. Oh, we did have a quiz, yeah, we had ABC type of thing. There are often multiple types of quiz questions, such as fill in the blank or true or false. An individual question 
an individual quiz question can be represented by a class with several properties. Okay, so question is a class, okay? The question text in quiz can be represented by a string. Question, yeah. Quiz question also need to represent the answer. However, different question types such as true or false may need to represent the answer using different data. Let's define three different types of questions, okay? Fill in the blank. The answer is string. True or false is boolean. Math problems. The answer is numeric value. By int, okay? In addition, quiz questions in our example, regardless of type of question, will also have a difficulty rating. Ooh. The difficulty rating is represented by a string with three possible values, easy, medium, hard. So define classes. Represent the quiz question. Go to Kotlin Playground. Yep. Um, above the main function, define a class for filling the blank questions named filling the blank question. Consisting of string property of question text. Uh, string property for answer and difficulty and copy it. Okay. Well, this should be tactic. Below the fill in the blank question class, define another class named true or false question. Oh, so those will be three different classes. Okay. I thought the idea was they're supposed to be the same class. Unless we're gonna connect them later. Okay, anyway. We have another class. It's gonna be a true or false with question string, answer boolean, difficulty string. Okay, they have to be different. The answers will be different, right? Finally, numeric question. And then numeric question will be the same. Answer will be the only difference. Do you notice repetition? Yes! I did notice repetition. Hello, yellow. <laughs> I did notice the repetition. All three class. This is why this um, tutorial is good. It lets you notice stuff and then like work on it. All three classes have the exact same properties. Question, answer, and difficulty. The only difference is the type of answer. Property. You may think that this obvious solution is to create parent class with the question difficulty. Yes. And each subclass define answer property. That that that's what I was thinking. However, okay. Using inheritance has the same problem as above. Every time you add a new type of question, you should add an answer property. The only difference is data type. It also looks strange to have a parent class question that doesn't have an answer property. Yeah, I guess that would be weird. And this is usually when my brain locks up and I don't know what to do next. When you want a property to have different data types, subclassing is not the answer. Instead, Kotlin provides something called generic types that allow you to have a single property that have different data types. Ooh, that's gonna be useful then. Basically, we can generic type our answer, yeah? Uh, generic types or generics for short allow a data type such as class to specify an unknown placeholder. Specify an unknown placeholder data type that can be used with Okay, I yeah, I, I see those brackets here. Yeah, that's what I expected. <sighs> a no place for the data type that can be used with its properties and methods. What exactly does this mean? In the above example, instead of defining an answer property for each possible data type, you can create a single class to represent any question and use placeholder name for the data type of the answer. Use a placeholder name for the data. I don't know what that means. 
The actual data type string in Boolean is specified when the class is instantiated, whenever the placeholder name is used. The data type passed into the class is used instead. Okay, I, I, it will make sense. I think I see that there is another class that's gonna be the placeholder class or something. That's what I'm feeling, but we're gonna see. Um, whenever the placeholder name is used, the data type passed into the class is used instead. The syntax for defining a generic type for class is shown below. Class name generic data type properties. A generic data type is provided when instantiating a class, so it needs to be defined as part of the class signature. After the class name comes a left single angle bracket followed by placeholder name for data types followed by right facing angle bracket, the placeholder name can be used whenever you use a real data type within the class, such as for property. Okay, so this doesn't make sense to me because it does theory never does and then they show the practice and it's like ah practical example <laughs> it's needed this is identical to any other property declaration except the placeholder names is used instead of okay so we will have the value right and gen generic data type so this is not the data type it's the placeholder name i guess yeah how would you how would your class ultimately know which data type to use the data type that generate type uses is passed as a parameter in our practice when you instantiate the class okay so it's decided upon upon instantiation that's generic name i need examples too much knowledge after the class name comes followed by actual data type string boolean int Followed by right bracket data type. So it looks like a list. The data type of value that you pass in for generic property. This is a list, isn't it? That's how lists work. They don't know what they're gonna hold and you define it when you're instantiating. Now it starts to make sense. The data type of the value that you passed in for generic property must match the data type in the angle bar. It will make the answer property generic so that you can use one class to represent any type of quiz question whenever it's string boolean int on or any arbitrary pattern. Ooh, lots of reading okay note the generic types passed in when instantiating a class are also called parameters although they're part of a separate parameter list then the property values okay i don't understand this <laughs> uh... Okay, they're called parameters, even though, although they're part of a separate parameter list. And then the property values placed inside the parameter list. I'm just going to accept this as a fact and I'm going to understand it later, probably. But they're called parameters. Okay. Like the example, both you often see generic type named T. Yes, we've seen it before for type or other capital letters if the class have multiple generic types we saw k as well however there is definitely not a rule and you can use more descriptive names okay so let's refactor our code finally refactor your code to use single name single class name question with generating answer property remove the class definitions okay remove class question after the bracket name but before the parenthesis add generic type okay generic type so if we compare it to those they had nothing okay this has t add the question type difficulty property Okay, let's copy them. I know yellow. I actually copy I cut it instead of deleting the one. Comment it out. No no, we literally have it here. 
you literally have a copy of it, so there's no problem. Normally I also comment in my code, but here this is totally unnecessary. Uh, okay, we add those, so we added string. Oh, the answer is T now, okay. So we kind of saying that this class has a secret type T in it, maybe. That's how I'm gonna understand it for now. It's a spy. Spy with the letter T in its name. Spy number T. Alright. <laughs> Sounds like property. Spy number T. Property. I guess it fits. Um, to see how it works with multiple question types, fill in the blank. Create three instances. Okay. So we have question one. And then we write string. And then we have the question and the thing. And now this is gonna be different because it's gonna be the answer. This is string, this is boolean, this is int. Okay. Run. Oh. Expecting. <laughs> okay, everything is wrong. Uh, okay. Why are you routing on me? Oh. That's oh, okay. I mistook the brackets actually. So the T should be before the okay, because it's a class. Huh? Um, yeah, so if, if we want more different types of answers, we can rewrite the same class apparently. Question is never used. Technical, we're never printing it, right? Uh, uh, tutorial? You, you told me to create three instances of the class, but uh, we never print it actually. If I do that, you're gonna print it? No, it has to be. Question text, I guess. Of the Raven. The answer is nevermore. But I don't know what's quaff. The sky is green, true or false? Well, most likely false. But I can imagine situations where it could be true. Comment. I don't know how to make this work. We'll get this soon. March 2000. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you should add to do in that so that it reminds you every time you commit. How many days are there between full moons? 28. Would I know it? Around 28, I would have guessed, I guess. But... All right, so it works. So if we, if we, if we, if we uh, try the answer. And then for every question, we're supposed to have different type of answer, yeah? Does it work? Yeah. This is boolean, this is int. It works. I'm gonna reread this generic data type. So we, we declare that there's a generic data type and then we use the data types. So this is what we did here. We had the T and then we used it here. And... specify a known place for the data type that can be used with methods and properties and methods okay so yeah it's like saying i'm a spy i have a spy within myself and there is a team cool so this is very useful actually i don't know how i'm going to use it but it is very useful instead of making like new subclass and something this is so much cleaner let's agree on that okay use an enum class in the previous section you defined a difficult property with possible values easy medium hard oh i see where it's going if you accidentally mistype three possible strings you could into this bar if the value change for example medium is renamed to average you will need to update all the usages of the string there's nothing stopping you or another referent from accidentally using a different string. 
Because it's harder to maintain if you add more difficulty levels. Actually, it's gonna be useful for our app as well. We will have like difficulty levels or something. It would be useful to have it defined. This is how people feel when buying tools at the DUI store. This is useful and then never take it in hand again. Uh... <laughs> So if I were to look at my code, which isn't showing for some reason, um, I have lots of repetition. I don't even know when to use it yet, but I know... For example, if we have this dialogue here... Okay, I will answer this differently. I know it's gonna be useful for lists. That we will need to implement. And the fact that I think I had a code for like one list already, like here, it wasn't a list actually, but it could be using a list and it could be using that type thing. Apart from that, well, for now it's like just just to our knowledge it exists yeah but this for example this enum this is gonna be useful for the uh, problems like instead of calling it uh, easy medium hard we could name it semain one semain two semain three and so on i already see yeah it could be used there or we could like say it's main one and three is easy semain five seven is medium anything else is hard or something like that and then super hard, whatever, yeah? Like, or five stars, whatever. Seems useful. <sighs> yeah, the code is harder to maintain if you add difficulty level, yeah. Kotlin helps you address these problems with a special type of class called enum, and enum is used to create types with a limited set of possible values. Mm. Okay. In real world, for example, the four cardinal direction, north, south, east, west, can be represented in any graph. Well, okay, cardinal direction, okay. I know there is north, west, and so on, but cardinal is that. There is no need, and the code shouldn't allow for the use of any additional direction. Okay. This would be the syntax. Case one, case two, case three. Each possible value, and it starts with venom, yeah? Its possible value of a menu is called enum constant. Because it's constant. A place inside the constructor separated by comma. The convention is to capitalize every letter in the constant. You need to refer enum using dots. You need a constant with dot. So why is the case named by small letter? Uh, uh, okay, anyway. <laughs> Use the enum constant. Modify your code uh, instead of using string to represent it. Put, okay, let's type it by hand. Enum class was the difficulty. Difficulty. And then here there were cases, right? And then, oh, they all have to be capitalized. That explains why um, Telmarch code is shouting at me. Um, I know this song. I rule tempo. Yeah, sounds like something else. Uh, Ten March Code has a read only initial position. A type of capital letters. I assume that's an N <laughs> or something like that. So easy, medium, hard. Okay. 
And it's in brackets for some reason. It said it's in a constructor. Did, did I mistake? It said it's in a constructor. Every constant may be, may are placed inside the constructor. This is inside the constructor. Okay, so those the previous ones were arguments or parameters. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the question class, change the data type of difficulty property from string to difficulty. Difficulty, because it's an enum. Yeah. Does it change the color? It doesn't change the color here. When you chose a free question, pass the enum cost. Instead of the text, we have even more text. But we cannot mistake that um, enum for anything else, right? Okay, I don't know what's all about this raven, but definitely this is difficult, more difficult question than the full moon to me, person. <laughs> okay. So does it run? It does. So, maybe we can... Um, I need to uh, be right back. can be hard to define nine can nine moves can be easy three moves can be hard and this is why you ask people to vote on it when they solve it <laughs> like on this show uh, the use of capitals is a bit putting things in katakana for emphasis it doesn't mean something but it highlights some things i think it was a constant in that case though so it's to indicate that it's unconstant the initial position never changes as long as you play shogi this is why it was shouting. I'm always the same! Don't change me! You know? Many of the classes we've worked so far are subclasses of activity. Now I'm terrified. Okay, I didn't know that. I have several methods to perform different actions. Uh, these classes don't just represent data, but also contain a lot of functionality. Classes are question class. On the other hand, contain only data. I don't have any methods. <laughs> they don't have any methods that perform. An this is why I sometimes use this screen reader thing to read it for me. But I, I, I know that for some people it might be irritating. It's not a face, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, they are data. They don't have any methods. Perform action. So it could be defined as data class. Defining a data, a class as a data class allows the Kotlin compiler to make certain assumptions and automatically implement some methods. I'm I'm a little bit confused because 
literally the definition of data class it doesn't have any methods and then Kotlin is like nope every that every class needs method like fine uh, <laughs> for example to string it's called behind the scenes by the printerland function when you use data class to string and other methods are implemented automatically based on the class property Okay, I'm gonna just accept it. It's a special thing that's treated differently than any other classes. I need to... Let me do something. So, to define a data class, simply add data keyword before the class word, okay? Data class. Convert question to data class. First, you will see what happens. First, you will see what happens when you try call method like to string on a class that isn't. Then you will convert to the main. Okay, so we already did it by mistake, actually. Um, but let's do that. We try to print that. I'm gonna say 49c to fire. So that's, that's really good. Then we're gonna add data to the class. Actually, I printed everything. Question. Question of the Raven. I mean, this is not what I would like to print, but you print it. Cool. Nice. How do you know, Kotlin? How do you know? How to show? It's a bit scary to me. <laughs> When a class is defined as a data class, the following methods are implemented. Oh, wait, I've seen this in Telmarch's code. Equals, definitely I saw the word equals. Um, hash code, you will see this method were working on certain collection types. Mm -hmm. For shadowing. The string, component n, component 1, component 2, and so on. Turning two values from a function. An enum or something? There. Okay. <laughs> something uh, allows you to get more out of it. Okay. Copy. All right. A data class needs to have at least one parameter in its constructor. Data class needs to have at least one parameter in its constructor, and all the constructor parameters must be marked val and var. The data class cannot be abstract, open, sealed, or inner. Okay, I don't know those two words, sealed or inner, but... We also didn't talk about abstract much. We talked about open, which I thought is the same as abstract, but apparently it's not, so... Uh... So basically, it's something that's basic and you cannot extend upon it, perhaps. Think it on. Hmm, I know. We use singletons in Unity before. That's a fireplace.
Oh, that would be useful for our lab. Also this. I mean, technically. I think we have something like this in our code. You can clearly communicate in your code that an object should have only one instead by defining as a singleton. It's only a class with only one single instance. Holding provides special construct called object yet can, that can be used to make a singleton class. If I were to check it for the word object, we have one object which actually calls for the I don't even know how to explain because Telmarch wrote this, but um this connects to the server and like, this creates a threat and this connects to the server so we want to have only one object that connects to the server now it makes sense <laughs> now it makes sense the syntax for an object is similar to that of class simply use object keyword instead of task a single object can have a constructor as you can create instance object instead all the properties are defined within the curtain bracket So it's something very rocky and solid and it doesn't want to change, similar to unconstant, I guess. Some of the examples given area might not be obvious, especially if you haven't worked with specific hardware device or dealt with authentication yet in your apps. However, you will see singular objects come up as you continue learning Android development. Let's see in action, simple example, for user state. For quiz, it would be great. We have a way to keep track of a total number of questions and the number of questions they answered so far. We will need only one instead of the class to exist. So instead of declaring a class, declare a singleton. So keeping track of how many questions. Because each person has only one progress bar. And we don't want them to redo the same thing, right? Object student. And it says something about it being all in the constructor, right? For this example, we assume that there are 10 total questions and that three of them are answered so far. So why is it a variable? Total could be a val, no? So var total. What does it say? Int. Oh no, this is normal. Int ten var answered three. Access a singlet object. Remember how we can create an instance for a singlet on object directly. Uh, how then you're able to access this property? Probably the same way as enum, for some reason. <laughs> Just a hinge. Because there's only one instance of student progress in existence at one time, you can access the property by referring to the name of object itself. Oh, so it's already created, I guess. Uh, followed by dot, followed by property. Okay. Update main function to access the properties of the singleton. In main, add a call to print ll. That outputs the answer. Okay. I copy it, but then I'm gonna try to understand it. So we're gonna have print ln. And then we have those. And then we have this, which should show the variable we have and we access it by writing student progress dot 
So this accesses the singlet from here. Okay. Same with the other. We run it. Three of ten questions answers. Three out of ten answers. Okay, it works. So that is when we want one thing at a time, yeah? Simply speaking. We don't want it to be accessed by more than two things at the same time because it would mess it up. Okay, we don't know anything more about it for now. And it starts with the word object. All right. Let's see that. Next, declare object as companion object. Companion cube! Class is an object in code can be defined inside other types. And can be a great way to organize your code. You can define a singleton object inside another class using a companion object. Singleton inside another class. I, why do I imagine like a parasite or like this hub? growing on the side of a tree that cannot be changed because it's a singleton. Actually, it could be changed. It just cannot be multiplied. It's like his only companion. Okay, then it makes sense. It's a companion. A companion object allows you to access its properties and methods from inside the class. It allows you to access its properties and methods inside the class. Okay. If the object properties and methods belong to that class, Allowing for more concise syntax. If the object properties and method belong to the class. <laughs> okay. To declare a companion, simply add companion word before the object. Companion object object name. You will create a new class called quiz to store the quiz questions and make student progress a companion object. Okay. Below the difficulty. Define a new class called quiz. I'm still confused about those brackets. Um, move question one, two, or three from main into the quiz class. You will need to remove print land if you have it already. Remove it, remove this. Inside the quiz. It's funny because when I'm learning Kotlin and then I show the code to Jean, who's a Java specialist, he's like, oh, it's so much easier in Kotlin. In Java, we would have to do so many more steps. I really like Kotlin. <laughs> he keeps saying that. I, I remember he was the most amazed that when you define like a function, you put it like outside the bracket. It's like, oh, it reminds me of this code when I used to do at the university or something like that. Okay, <laughs> I hit a note there with that simple action. So yeah, he seems to be enjoying it, learning it uh, on the side. Java loves developers to do so many terrible things. Maybe this is why I never liked it. I never understood it. Kotlin seems very clear to me so far. I mean, it has its own difficulty. Um, we came up with this draw. <laughs> it's a silly drawing, but we try to explain how a square, when it's clicked, goes to the board and then how it gives the data to the almighty god of Android that's gonna hold all the states. It's kind of funny because now every time we talk about the states, it's like, remember the almighty god needs to know about the state. <laughs> and it's stupid because the, the square, it's like, I am clicked. And then it gives that information to the board and it's like, this square was clicked. And then the god is like, okay, now that this happened, you shall do this. You have to like give the function. For me, it's like it's like opposite. You give the function upward instead of downward when you do with the arguments, which is very confusing. But by making the stupid Almighty God reference, I kind of understand how it works. 
So every time I try to <laughs> create a function, a function that has a function in it, I have to remember about the Android God on the top of the hierarchy. <sighs> anyway, um, put it in quiz, move the student's progress object into the quiz class. Wait, why? Oh, because it's the companion object. Okay. Mark the student progress object with companion keyword. Companion, companion, I cannot write. Uh, update the call to print alert to reference the properties with quiz answered and quiz total. Even though the properties are declared inside the student pro object, they can be accessed with a dot. So instead of student, we will have quiz. I don't exactly know how is it useful. I mean, it made code so much clearer, I have to agree. But... I don't understand. I'm just gonna accept that something like this exists. It's a singleton and it can be put inside of other things. So then question is, is the quiz the only function that can access it? Maybe you can block the access to it, then it would be useful. Did I say function? I meant class, yeah. I'm getting distracted by the music. Extend classes with new properties and methods. When working with combos, you might have noticed some interesting syntax when specifying the size of UI elements in a modifier. Numering types, such as double, appear to have properties like DP and SP specifying dimensions. Yes. Uh, why would the designers of Kotlin language include properties and functions on built-in data types specifically for building Android UI? Were they able to predict the future? Was Kotlin designed to be used with Compose even before Compose existed? Of course not. Okay. I was starting to believe some. <laughs> when you're writing a class, you don't often exactly know how another developer will use it or plan to use it in their app. It's not possible to predict all the possible future cases. Nor it is wise to add unnecessary blow to your code for some unforeseen use case. What the Kotlin language does is give other developers the ability to extend existing data types, properties and methods that can be accessed with dot syntax as if they were part of the data type. So I guess in this case double extends itself into DP. A developer who didn't work on float oh did I say double it's float. It's a double, now it's float, okay. A developer who didn't work on the floating types in Kotlin, for example, such as someone building the compost library, might choose to add properties and methods specific to UI dimensions. Since you've seen the syntax when you compose in the first few units, it's time for you to learn how this works under the hood. You will add some properties and methods to extend existing types. Add an extension property. To define an extension property, add the type name and operator before the variable. Type name. Dot property name. And data type. Property getter. Uh, okay. You will refactor the code in the main to print the quiz progress into an extension. Okay. I'm scared. I, I understand zero of what I'm reading right now. Below the quiz class, define an extension property of quiz student progress name progress name. <laughs> I'm just gonna do it and see if I understand. Um, Below the quiz class, define. Below the quiz class, define an extension property of 
Grüße zurück. Und Like here? This is like under it. That's what I'm confused about. Below the class. Like, like this? <laughs> I have no idea. But it says you will refract the content main to print the quiz. So is this inside the main? Then <clears throat> I have no idea. I'm so confused right now. <laughs> it says below the quiz class define the extension property of quiz student progress and progress test. I put it under. Here it is, it's under. Define a getter for the extension property that Returns the same string as for the main. Okay. It's not gonna work, but replace the main code. Because this is an extension property of the compiling object, you can access it with a dot. Extension property can store data, so they must be get on. If we run this, it's gonna throw an error, hopefully. Okay, I don't understand why is it working. Because this is outside everything. <laughs> <laughs> So basically we've defined a string that has a getter like a value inside the to the progress of quiz. We extended it for some reason. I might have to read more about it. It's an extension property, and we extend it. This is so abstract to me right now. That's good. It allows you to create an extension example for a specific file only. But like, why wouldn't you make into a val? inside of it why does it need to be an extension it's like weird to me like we could have put it here right like this and call it progress string progress text whatever and use it instead why do we need to like make an extension out of it you could use it normally you wouldn't use it okay <laughs> Okay, so it's one of those things I accept it exists. I don't know why exactly. I type it in the Google and at Kotlin. Does it give me more info, for example? Maybe it will make more sense for functions. 
Yeah, let's just just continue. <clears throat> but sometimes you use classes that you didn't build because I would guess that you can extend classes like integers. Yeah, that that makes sense. If we don't want to touch the class and you just want to extend it, as they said with this float thing. Yeah, Rock, I think you're making sense here. Like, I don't know exactly now, I don't know exactly like why would you want to do that? But let's say I don't want to touch the class itself and I want to have another functionality or value. Okay, let, let's let's say it's just like additional hand you have. <laughs> you don't want to have another human, so you glue additional hand to it. Does it make sense, right? <laughs> but yeah, okay, if we don't want to touch the class or we cannot touch the class, an extension makes sense, right? And this is why it's outside the class here, and that makes sense. We're not touching the class itself. Let's keep that sense for now, even though it might be not 100% correct, but it gives us some security, and some confidence in what we're doing. So, okay, and it makes sense they cannot store data. They, they can only get data, right? Yes, we cannot really um, access the class. Add an extension function. So now we. We had property, now we go to function. Now it's gonna get complex. Function type, function name, parameters, return type, this is normal, right? We have this extension dot, yeah? But before the function name. Okay, so this was the name and it's kind of confusing because it's extension, but it goes backwards. <laughs> extension normally goes the other way. Okay, uh, you will add an extension function to output the crease progress as a progress bar. Okay. Since you can actually make a progress bar in Cotton Playground, you will print out a retro style progress. This is something I did in high school. Um, add an uh, extension function to the student progress object called print progress bar. This function should take no parameters and have no return value. Print out the Pokemon uh, null, whatever was the name of that error Pokemon character. What's the name of that Pokemon? Anyway, <laughs> answered number times using repeat. Uh, this dark the portion of the progress bar represent the questions answered is print because you don't want new line okay so where do we put it just it says add an extension so i'm just gonna put it after this and see if it works uh we have this code. Let's see if we understand. We have quiz student progress dot print progress bar. The same as before, but with the brackets. And then inside of it, we have repeat quiz answer number of times print Pokemon. Okay. And then this will be the re remaining ones. Yeah. So total minus answered and then the remaining. Oh, this is so smart, actually. And we print space, enter, and then progress text. Okay. What is progress text? Is the previous one, yeah? Previous extension. Okay. Update to instead print. Please print progress. Okay. Progress. It doesn't have the word print in it. Yeah, it does. Okay. I'm surprised it works this way. That you can just say quiz dot print progress bar, even though it was like this. Or I guess because it's inside of this singleton and this 
Thus can access everything inside of the companion, right? Okay. Will it work? Worked. Right. Looks so epic, actually. Um, I think a good example when you would use, uh, like, when you would like to use it is, for example, sorting the array of objects that someone created. To sort this array, the code needs to know how to compare the objects, but unfortunately, there is no default comparator in this class. But Kotlin allows you to extend the class with a comparator function. That sounds good. Which is kind of funny because the, the whole point of creating classes was to like encapsulate. That was my understanding. And now we are like, so yeah, we allow you to encapsulate, but we also allow you to extend just in case you needed to add something. Like, <laughs> it's like the opposite thing, I kind of feel like it. But yeah, in that practical example, it does kind of make sense. It would be frustrating to not being able to do that, yeah. It is, is it mandatory to do any of this? Certainly not. Thank you, tutorial. However, having the option of extension properties and methods gives you more options to expose your code to other developers. As, as uh, Roke explained, yeah. Using dot syntax on other types can make your code easier to read, both for yourself and other developers. And yeah, many things are like for readability, I realize. Like, normally you don't need it, but when you have these huge blocks of code, becomes necessary for you to even understand what's going on. Okay, this is the last one. Use scope functions to access class properties and methods. We are learning so much and it's a little bit too much. As we've seen already, Kotlin includes a lot of features to make your code more concise. One such feature you encounter as you continue learning is scope functions. Allow you to consistently access properties and methods from a class without having to repeatedly access the variable name. Okay, what does it mean? Look at the example. Eliminate repetitive object references with scope functions. Scope functions are higher order functions that allow you to access properties and methods of an object without referring to the object's name. These are called scope functions because the body of the function passed uh, in takes on the scope of the object. <laughs> These are called scope functions because the body of the function passed in takes on the scope of the object that scope function is called in. Okay. For example, some scope functions allow you to access the pro some scope functions are able to access the properties and methods in a class, as if the functions were defined as a method. In okay. This can make your code more readable by allowing you to omit the object name when including the return. To better illustrate, let's take a few examples. Replace long object using let. Again, it's not something you have to do, I assume, it's something that makes it more readable. If I think of it that way. Uh, the let function allows you to refer to an object in uh, lambda. If I see word lambda, it's stress 10,000 plus. Uh, the let function allows you to refer to an object in a lambda expression using the identifier it. Instead of the actual name. Okay, we did have the it before. This can help you avoid using a long, more descriptive object name repeatedly when accessing more than one property. The let function is an extension function that can be called on any Kotlin object using dot notation. Okay. I understand what is extension function now. Yay! Try accessing the property question 1, 2, 3 using that. Add a function to quiz climb named pin quiz. Was it private? Just increase and the brackets. Okay. 
add the following code that prints up the questions. God. Everything basically. While multiple properties are accessed for question 1, 2, and 3, the entire variable name is used each time. The variable name change needs to update single usage. Okay. So yeah, this is very repetitive indeed. And if the variable name changed. Yeah. Sounds the code accessing the question text answer with good properties. Surround the code accessing the question answer the different properties with a call to let function of question one, two, three. Um, replace the variable name with oh god with it. Uh, 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 oh, that's actually interesting. Question one dot let no cons no no constructor and then. Instead of having question everywhere, you can put it. Oh, that's cool. Like this. It makes it way more readable. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna copy it. Create an install quiz, class named quiz, and then print. Uh, quiz equal a uh, small quiz. Class quiz, then quiz dot print quiz. Is it how it's supposed to look? No. Run your code. Boop. So, oh, I have to scroll down. Okay, uh, so it did print out the question and the answer and the difficulty for all three questions. That looks like an actual quiz right now. <laughs> hey. Hmm. What's it called again? Scope function. How's it refer to an object in a lambda expression? So it's like. I mean, what I used to do is like. Um, I guess it makes sense. Just a funny way to do it. Okay, just another tool in our shed. So if we have long name, we can use that to make it shorter. That's cool. But then it makes it... I don't know if you guys... how you guys feel of it. We need to put it in another function, which makes it more nested. Which may look it... make, make it look more ugly as a result. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of that, but... Sure. This is a little bit more readable, yeah? We can agree on that. <sighs> Call an object's methods without variable. Using apply. I mean, it's also good to like know those to then be able to read others' code. I guess, so I don't have to use them immediately, but good to know. Call an object's methods without a variable. One of the cool features of scope functions is that you can call them on an object before that object have ever been assigned to the variable. You can call them on an object before that object has been assigned to the For example, the apply function is an extension function that can be called on an object using dot not. The apply function also returns a reference to that object. Dot Does it work? Update the main to call the apply. <laughs> I'm confused already. Uh, the call apply after closing parenthesis when creating a list of the quiz code.
Anchor feature of scope functions that you can call them on an object before that object has been assigned to a variable. So here I guess we had this variable quiz thing, but you want to call on it before it's assigned. For example, the apply function can do that. The apply function returns a reference to that object. Also returns reference, so it could be stored in a variable. Okay, so... I don't know why we would do that. But this code apparently does the same thing as this code, right? Basically. Oh, okay, so we don't need to create an instance of the class at all with this. <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, not that you were able to call this method without using reference. The apply function return the objects which were stored in quiz. It did work. So it was the default values, yeah? Why using scope functions is mandatory to achieve a desired offer? The above examples illustrate how they can make your code more concise to avoid repeating the same variable name. The code above demonstrates two examples, but you can bookmark this page. Sure, let's put market. There's something called scope functions. You just got the chance to see several new Kotlin features in actions. Generic allow, generics allow data types to be passed as parameters to classes. Enum classes define a limited set of possible values, and data classes help automatically generate some useful methods for classes. Okay. You also saw how to generate a singleton object, which is restricted to one instance, how to make it a companion object of another class, and how to extend existing classes with a new get-only properties and new methods. Finally, you saw some examples of how scope functions can provide a simpler syntax uh, when accessing properties and methods. You will see concepts later you need to learn more about Kotlin and so on. And we will have a better understanding. So I will write down those names. To write them down so. <laughs> and I like that. Enum needed set of various data classes. Oops. Singleton one instance. 
uh, companion object extend extension properties and method uh, scope functions let and apply okay wow that was a lot of theory <laughs> so much that it signed me out of course Please, I finished this. Please give me the pleasure of seeing a green mark next to it. It's refusing to give me a green mark. This is all I live for. I want my green mark. <laughs> oh well. Oh, it did give me. Yay, green mark. Okay. Um, we can close those. Use collections. One hour and a half. Wow, that was a long study. So definitely I will need this for my app. Um, something that looks like this and it says... Uh, we need to lose collections. Collection times, sometimes for data structures, let you store multiple. Collection types, data structure. Let you store multiple values typically of the same data type in an organized way. The collection can be an ordered list, grouping of unique values, a mapping of values of one data type to another. Come up. The effect ability to affect use collections enables you to implement common features of Android apps. Ooh. Such as chronic lists, as well as a sort variety of real life programming problems that involve arbitrary amounts of data. Okay. Let me check again. Uh, list set map. Okay. What is an array? I know what is an array. Oh, <laughs> they say it's like a grouping of solar panels. The solar array. Uh, or how learning code in Oxford app another possibility to the programming career. <laughs> Uh, an array represents more than one value. Specifically, uh, well, the problem with that in your career is that you can choose only one in the end, so... But I guess you have a list to choose from. Specifically, an array is a sequence of values that all have the same data type. Alright? Yeah, elements called items, the elements order back with index. What's an index? It's a number that corresponds to an element. Distance from the start called zero index. Okay, so it also starts with zero. That's a good hint. In the device memory, elements in the array are stored next to each other. Where under with the underlying details are beyond the scope of the scroll up. This has two important implications. Accessing an array element by its index is fast. You can access any random element of an array by its index uh, and expect it to take the same amount of time to access any other random. This is why it is said that arrays have random access, which I think was different from like other types of structures, it like stacks or something. You'd have to go through everything to get to it. Random access. 
An array has a fixed size. This means you can't add elements to array beyond its size. Trying to access the element of index 100, which are an exception because the highest index 99. You can modify the values in the array, however. In this code lab, memory refers to a short-term random access memory RAM on the device, not the long-term precision storage is called random access because it allows fast access to an ordinary arbitrary location memory. To declare an array code, you will see you can use array of function. Okay. Array of data type. Oh, that's useful. We learned it just a second ago. The array function takes the array element as parameters and returns an array of type matching the parameters possible. This might look a little bit different from other functions you've seen because array of has a varying number of parameters. If you pass two arguments, the array will have two elements. If you pass three, it will have three. Let's see arrays in action of small exploration of solar system. Okay. Okay, that explains. This is their Kotlin, and this is some other Kotlin. That kind of explains why it looks different. <sighs> Don't worry, I made a copy. <clears throat> In the main, create a rock planets variable. Okay, all rock planets. All array of passing string along the four strings. Okay. Array of string. And is it like a parameters, I guess. Because Kotlin is a type interface, you can omit the type name while calling array of. Below the rocket balance variable, add another variable gas balance without passing a type into the angle okay. The same thing, but without the string thing. Great that we used the whole string thing so that we can omit it, right? <sighs> we can do some cool things with arrays, for example, just like numeric types. I'm, I'm, no, it's very useful because now we know that array of actually takes like a, any type. Now we know how it works, actually. You can do some cool things with arrays. For example, just like numeric types int or double, you can add two arrays together. Create a new variable called solar system and set it as a result of the addition. And then we should run it, that it works, but we shouldn't see anything. Okay. Access element in array. This is called subscript syntax. It consists of three parts, name, opening, index. I know this, yeah. Let's access element by the indexes. In the main access, the print elements. Not how the first element is, zero and then seven. Okay. Please give me a for loop. This looks horrible. <laughs> Okay, anyway, we got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. All right. <clears throat> Pluto is in the planet. Run your program. <laughs> okay. You can also set the value of the array element uh, by its index. Okay, accessing the index the same as before. Okay, I know that. So here we're gonna change. Let's give Mars a new name for its future human settlers. I love this tutorial. So now it should say Little Earth. Cool. Now let's say scientists made a discovery that is nine plan beyond Neptune or Pluto. Okay. What would happen if we try to resize an array? Okay. I'm trying to resize the array. Exception in thread main. Index 8 out of bounds. This is the most popular error that I've got in my life. 
run the code, it's just the error, the error because the error is too small, yeah? Remove. Sorry, Pluto. There's only limited amount of uh, space in the solar system. If you want to make an array larger than it already is, you have to create a new array. Define a new variable called new solar system. Okay. Yeah. Cannot, cannot I just do this? But then just add Pluto like this. It doesn't work like this. I guess this only works for arrays. Cans of worms open. <laughs> okay. I guess if this... Okay. if I did this and self reference uh okay uh that pains me oh, well I guess there is some way to do it but for now um it says basically you need to create a new array okay um Great job! With your knowledge of Aries, you can almost do anything with collections. Yeah, wait, not so fast. Why Aries are one of the most fundamental sources of programming using an array for a task that require adding or removing elements, uniqueness of a collection, or mapping objects to another object. Is it exactly simple or straightforward? Thank you for saying that. This is why most programming languages, including Kotlin, implement special collection types to handle situations that mostly occur in real-world apps. In the following sections, you will learn about list set map. I really need that list, but I don't remember exactly how is it different from a set. I know what I'm... Do we need map or list, actually? Just list. Oh, is the rock planet? But does it... I don't think it... Method because I wanted. No, I don't think it matters because they both are uh, strings. I don't know what it shouted. It shouted. In this eight is out of bonds for length five. Oh, that's why. I see. Uh, I see, because we added 8. Actually, I did add it. It did work. Ah. No, no. So the problem is our array was too small because I used the wrong array and had 5. It, 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 the, the rock planet has 4 to begin with, but it became 5. But I tried to access 8. So I had to use 7, put it to 8, and then it worked. Yeah. Thanks, Rog. <laughs> okay, so it, it does work. Okay, you can create a new uh, uh, array by just adding an element like this stupidly. Oh, good to know. <laughs> so you kind of can change... Okay, you cannot change the array size. You would have to make a new array. Yeah, Doesn't change the conclusion. Okay. A list is an order resizable collection. Resizable. Okay, that's a clue word. And it's ordered. Ordered how? Typically implemented as a resizable array. 
You just said arrays are not resized. Okay, whatever. When the arrays fields to capacity and it, maybe it does what I did, but it does it in a function. Oh, it does. Okay, I'm smart. When the arrays fields to capacity and you try to insert new element, the arrays copy it to a bigger array. Yay, I got it. <laughs> it does work this way. Not enough room for a new element, new array. With a list, you can also insert uh, new elements between older elements. Okay. All elements with higher indices will be moved. Okay. This is how lists are able to add and remove elements. In most cases, it takes some amount of time to add an element to the list, regardless of how many elements are in the list. Uh, I, I mean, I learned at school about complexity, and I know it's important to know this, but as you learn about the list the first time... Is this really necessary? I wonder. Anyway, every once in a while, if you add... If adding a new element would put the array above its defined size, the array elements might have to move to make a room for new elements. Please do this all for you, but behind the scene, it's just an array that gets swapped for a new array. Oh, list and mutable is oh god, mutable. Mutable is a Kotlin thing. Manually writing code to expand or shing or access prude dredger. Yeah, I, I can I can imagine. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, the collection times we're encountering Kotlin implements one or more interfaces. The word interface is still terrifying to me, by the way. So, uh, as you learned in the generic subjects and extensions code lab area in this unit, interfaces provide a standard set of properties and methods for a class to implement. I should write down this sentence. It's 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 very understandable. Interfaces provide standard set of parties and methods or a class to implement. That's gonna create a new array, no? Unless that's how the list work. I mean, it's gonna work the same way this works, right? I click to insert. No, go back. It does work. But I think what's going behind the scenes is creating a new array, basically. It's the only way it can work. That's my logic. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. So list is read only and mutable list extends the list by defining methods to modify a list. Normally a list would be mod, mod, modifiable. Modif 
possible to be modified in other languages, so it's funny they have mutabilis here. I guess it makes sense, but... It's up to the class that extends them to determine how each party method is implemented. You see, so you can allow not to extend. Okay, but this one is allowed. The list of functions. You like array of a list of functions. Takes the items as parameters, but it returns a list. Okay. Remove the existing code from main. Bye bye, solar system. In C, oh god. My gen we started with C hash with C hash C plus plus. I don't know about C. Um, <clears throat> okay, so remove, create a list of planets. Create a list of planets. As a list this time. They want an improvement. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune. The list. Cool. List has size. Do you? Eight. Cool. So it's dot size. Okay. Yep. I'm enjoying Kotlin so far. Access elements from a list. Like an array, you can access an element at a specific index from a list using subscript syntax. This is so hard to say. Subscript syntax. Like my neck is moving wrongly when I say that word. You can do the same using get method. Oh, cool. Subscript syntax and the get method take an int as a parameter and return element. Why, why do you have the get method? Is it like nicer for the eye or... I don't know, maybe two ways to do the same thing. Like array array list is zero indexed. Okay, so it starts from zero, the fourth element three. Print index two. Yeah, so there should be two different things, yeah? <clears throat> so this one prints out earth. Zero one two. And this with a get. You want to free, which is Mars. Okay. In the addition to getting an element by its index, you can also search for index of a specific element using index of. Okay, so we get the number, yeah? The index of searches the list of given element passed as an argument, returns the first occurrence. If the element doesn't occur, it returns n one. So if we want to know which in the solar system is earth plus one <clears throat> is two would be three and then pluto is in existent the solar system as a plan plan your code yeah there might be a difference with the uh, square brackets and get return when you're trying to get a value out of array bands oh that's a good point so array, okay, uh, let's say 12. Yeah, it also says index out of bounds though. It's the same. <laughs> yeah, it's the same error. Maybe it handles it differently, I don't know. Maybe you can handle it differently, the programmer. Okay, I wonder if I should get a fruit starting to get hungry for more tea. 
more hot tea. Uh, yeah, two minutes break. Should we watch some shuggy game while I eat the apple? <laughs> I wonder if Shuggy Club 24 is more fun to watch, actually. Um, Shuggy up, yep. Um, you know, we have this Discord with Shuggy people. I didn't really, uh, blah, blah, blah. I didn't read Lee Shuggy Cods because there is uh, Lee Shuggy people for that, Lee Shuggy Group, Lee Shuggy Discord. 
what we're doing is <coughs> me and my husband we work on this page instead which is as you see more basics doesn't allow you to play against players but have puzzles like opening explorer and stuff and basically i was thinking i'm gonna make mobile app for that because because i was since i got pregnant i was playing solitaire on my phone because i don't want to move from my bed often and i'm like this is so addicting i want to make Tsume app like that and this is why we started making the app the shogi um mobile app i think they're working on it but there's nothing yet yeah yeah so for now i don't know if you guys were here in the beginning of the stream um For now it looks like this. And you can load that Sumay in 5. And then actually this is quite interactive already. Okay, that was a made but we didn't implement. It has only one solution unfortunately. Normally it would accept the answer but... Um, basically it allows you to solve it. It allows you to give up and see the answer yourself uh, and then I wanted to have like this daily tsume so like this this would be a calendar and it would force you to do one tsume daily or something like that um, and I need lists specifically for this button that's gonna show you the list of moves that were played which for tsume is irrelevant but for later if we want to like view the whole kifu it would be very useful to like open the list, click on the move, and then teleport the position to that position. Or copy the whole list uh, as a Kifu. It, it, it would be very useful. And in the next unit, I will need something to, instead of just pop-up dialogue, I will have a different view where you can change your settings. This is why we're doing the tutorial, because I don't know how to do this stuff yet. <laughs> Hi, Conteti. Mm. I could have cut the apple more. You should get like leeches, yeah. I mean, Dermarch cannot like sell his work because he works at Google or like it would be very complicated, so we're doing it for free as well. Like the whole page is free and everything is free and it's like open source I think even. Sure. Don't wanna lie about the open source, I'm not sure if it's open source. Remember? Passport. Yeah, Secretly, I don't like Shogi because it doesn't really have draws, but I also wish Taikyo to Shogi was playable. Um, I like the fact it doesn't have draws. And I love the drop mechanic, because it allows you to do that sume that we're doing up for. And speaking of extension, I plan to extend the app as well to do like find the next move problems and like Kifu viewer, maybe Kifu commented Kifu, stuff like that.
the bottom side seems to be a bit confident. But with this castle, you never know. So, for example, this is on different level now. There are two pieces attacking. You move the gods, they're gonna push this pawn. Mm, yeah, I guess. We should drop his root goes to the center. Ah, so they're gonna attack like diagonally, maybe. Yes, this castle, as you can see, is very solid still. And this is only under pressure. We wanted to attack here, but the knight is under attack now. Probably top is going to win. This is a very, very aggressive route they have chosen, but... I mean, Anaguma Rush. Like a Zerg rush. It's shoggy tactic here. The game is so stuff. They got a free silver and the knight will be able to promote the bishop will be able to mount four attacking pieces unstoppable. And Aguma is safe, so there's no counter possible, no defense possible. It's gonna take a lot of time, yeah. Knight promotion, pound promotion takes. Do something, takes, takes. It's like lots of move necessary. And we're giving them more pieces too. And here. Like, we take the rook, we have checkmate threats already, so it's like one. It's more like one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, one, two, three. This one takes one, two, right? It doesn't make sense what I'm saying, probably, but this is why we're gonna do the <laughs> beginner video next level on Endgame. To make oh, this is even faster. Okay, it was one instead of one, two. If they take the horse, they checkmate it. They have to run, or they want to. It said one, two, but it's actually. Yeah, it's checkmate. <laughs> Should resign. Quite unusual for him to not resign <laughs> until the last move. Okay, he did resign. If he didn't, it would be very rude. <laughs> Hi, Pinator. 
We're just getting an apple break. Watching some shogi. Um. <clears throat> So if I learn the list, let's let's see my roadmap. Um, if, ooh, wait, my order collection. Update the group by full cycle. Um, if I learn those maps or lists, we are one step closer to creating settings. I don't know if we're one step closer or not, because the list that it required basically it had something called Where would it be? Uh, in the under the dialogue. I'm not gonna find it. Maybe I deleted. Did I delete it? No. Yeah, we're on the moment where I didn't refactor the code, and it's really hard to find anything. I know. I know. We'll be working on it tonight, in March. I know. Please don't judge me. <laughs> This one. <clears throat> Checkbox list, which was array of. And it had something called set multiple choice items. We want. Ah! Their dialogue. Maybe we don't even need, like, lists in general. Yeah, we have to survive this unit and the next one to arrive at something called. Navigation chapter, and then they're gonna teach us how to do it, I guess. But having the ability to create lists and maps seems very useful in general. Oh uh, yeah, and but for Kifu we really need it. Uh, so much work to do. So much code already. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. If you saw Contetti, I, I I keep re-showing you guys because you guys keep joining, but this is the current state. It, it's actually playable already. You can promote stuff and like if I give up, you can see the answer. If I skip and wanna solve it, and allow me to solve it. It of course doesn't tell you that you solved it or like if it's incorrect yet, but like, if you know what you're doing, it's usable. Yeah, they move, they move. I mean, if you do the illegal move, or like... The wrong move, okay, even if it's legal, if you play the wrong move... Um, it's not gonna give you feedback that it's wrong move, it's just not gonna tell you to move. Like, here I unpromote, it just ignored me completely. It would show something red that it's illegal. But if you understand it, fuck, you can play and then it unlocks the buttons. The Kifu is not there, as I said. We need list for that. Yeah, so technically it's, it's already playable, you know. I I do it on the way to German class already. Uh, I don't know the solution. Uh, is it just this? Yeah, I double clicked and here it cancelled, so it gave me no prompt what I did wrong, yeah. And yeah, you can here you cannot select. Normally you can select everything. You select. Yeah, it all works. It's took a lot of effort. The promotion, guys! The promotion is such a complex code. I thought it's gonna be like one more dialogue, like promote or not. But turns out you need to trick the program into thinking that you're making a legal move when it's when it's like not the correct one so the code that checks oh should i allow this move uh, should i allow this move it will work wrongly with promotion so we had to 
create another code that pretends you're playing the correct move by allowing promotion, but at the same time it doesn't allow you like play actual illegal moves. Like it has to be within those three rows, it has to be not gold, not king, yeah. You know, promotion is already implemented, yeah? Because Telmarch had the library. But the code for it is like gruesome. Where is it? Uh, was it here? Oh, has decide. So this is a code to decide. Oh, you guys don't see. It. Sorry. Yep. So this is a code to decide whenever your correct move for normal move. So like when you click on the board, yeah. This is a um, correct move for drop move. This is correct move for promotion. And this, the size of those three is to decide whenever you, you show the promotion prompt. And it has Shogi Rules engine, which is a whole another library. It has to had to actually evaluate if the move you're making is capture or not, which is different from the other moves. And then it has this horrendous looking statement at the end, basically saying if the move is legal and whenever it can move with promotion or without to trigger the dialogue. So basically if I were to promote the pawn on the last row, it's not gonna trigger it because it cannot make unpromoted movement, yeah, basically. But it, it's way too complex, way we did it yesterday, way too complex compared to those. <laughs> this hurts my eyes to look at it. We still need to add this code that double checks the answer because some of those problems are not, as you guys know, legitimate. Um, there are sometimes two answers, yeah, or like three answers because of like both pieces can promote or unpromote on the same square. And we don't have that code yet. This is a code that I actually implemented in PlayShoggy, but yeah, <laughs> we need to work on that as well. Feature suggestion. After wrong moves, it can pop a message in two modes. A simple incorrect or roast mode. Gives passive mess aggressive messages. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do for that... I don't know where this is in code. Um, I think it's in like boards or something. Controls. There's a lot of lambdas here. This is also terrifying. Controls uh, or the board, actually. It was something named color modifier. The side square color. And if I were to show you, for example, I'm going to mess up this code a little bit. And instead of if selected, I'm going to put um, is checkmated. Yeah. So, for example, for the. I want to have something like this for checkmate line. Okay, it's gonna throw an error. Maybe I shouldn't show you guys. <laughs> uh... It doesn't work now. Okay, so... <sighs> Uh, 
I just wanted to show you the colors that we will have. So it's gonna be red behind the king when it's checkmated like this. But this is not implemented. Yeah, I can I can do that because I have the color ready, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Then we will have something called is the last move. I don't know exactly what it's supposed to do. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, the last move. Like you play that move, and it's gonna show you which move was played. But that's more for Kifu. So again, we didn't implement it, but it's gonna be this color. Like pawn moved from here to here. It's gonna show you color, right? Um, and finally, we have is possible move, which is uh, it's an option in menu for beginners when you wanna select the colors. When you want to see where the piece can move, I chose this color. Um, so for example, the pawn should show that it can move forward, yeah? And it should be green. So this should be purple and this should be green. I don't know how the color palette works, <laughs> if it's good or not, but we could implement that still, yeah? <clears throat> now let's go back to whatever was working before. Yeah, so for now it's like purple, yeah? No. <sighs> Is there canonical emoji substitution for shaggy pieces? I don't think so. We have our own emoji and stickers on Discord. So I would prefer to show like the move was wrong and then like flush the piece red. Um, showing why the move doesn't work is a very complex issue because in order to show why a move doesn't work you would need a computer to solve the problem for you. Why this problem is not a checkmate, basically, which is a very complex issue because this is five moves, but it can go like 21 moves deep. And then the sub variation can be like 50 moves deep. And for us humans, we are like, oh yeah, we don't have enough pieces to checkmate the king. But the computer is like, I need to try every possible check on the board. Like it would take ages to solve it. Uh, Telmar Zo implemented the button on PlayShock, I think. Tell me why. Um, but it's instead of showing the whole variation, I think it shows you the next move or something like that. Simpler. I think if we have three moves and like, this is the solution, and then we play wrong move, there is this tell me why button, and it says Gote is not in check. To solve a similar problem, every move needs to be a check. So it's something obvious, but page tells you. So for example, if you drop the rook here, tell me why. Tells you that it can escape. So we have something like this working, yeah? We could implement it to the mobile app, probably. I don't know how it works, but yeah, we could put it there. It's just that I don't want to spam the screen because What's satisfying about this app? Guys, before the promotion, it was just satisfying. Like, it didn't ask you if you want to promote. You would just move the piece, it would promote it for you. It's very satisfying. So we were thinking of adding options, like, oh, you don't need to have the promotion prompt. Because you go like, pro, 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 pro. You know? So, this doesn't work. I don't know what's the solution. <laughs> um, this doesn't work because the rook is there. So instead of that, it simply doesn't allow you to play the move, right? Yeah, like this, so that you immediately have a chance to try another one, which could be cheating and so on. Uh, but it's better than, boop, wrong move, and then you have to click cancel. Boop, wrong move, and you have to click cancel. I think it's frustrating when you have too many pop-ups. I'm already too frustrated 
that there is the uh, promotion pop up. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. What's the solution to this one? Just here. Yeah, it's kind of satisfying because you can go like, like solve everything here. I made a mistake yeah, immediately. I can correct myself. And there is not much stress that it's like failed. Redo it. You, you guys know that Sumeshagi Paradise on the Android, if you fail, you have to redo the whole variation. And it's frustrating because sometimes you just misclick. And you're like, no, I have to do 11 moves. Like, it's frustrating. So I think this implementation is a little bit better. And then, of course, if you made a mistake, you can always use those arrows to like come back. Because let's be honest, this has to be a study tool. Yeah, something fun. I mean, I know that study and fun doesn't go often together, but I, with my experience, I kind of know what it's fun and what's annoying. So I just made this least annoying as I can. I wanted to add a cool thing. I don't know, maybe some of you guys know how Android works. I wanted to make something for the promotion prompt, which when you promote a piece, it shows a pop-up above the piece. We just click the four two squares. So we have the finger there. And then instead of clicking the promote or not promote, I want to have a gesture. If you swipe upwards, it promotes. If you swipe downwards, it unpromotes. Something like this. I just don't know how to implement it yet. I think it would be cool because in Shogi, when you make movement on the board, usually you have to flip the piece to promote, which makes the upward movement. And when you unpromote, you just slap it down. So I thought it would be cool to have this movement like click click and then swipe click click down you know i mean there should be the buttons as well but additionally like this click click swipe it would be way more satisfying i think i just don't know how to implement it i wish there was like this wheel of option that appears we were joking with telmars the other day <laughs> like wheel of options and then you place with someone online and while you make a move you can emote at the same time by swapping left or right <laughs> it would be pretty funny But I just don't have the knowledge how to do it. The fact that I did this dialogue prompt like this instead of pop-up is because I got frustrated with pop-up. I didn't know how to implement it yet. Um, pop-up, the difference within this and pop-up is that when you have pop-up, it's gonna you can make it appear here instead of in the middle. And then you can modify how it looks, I assumed. And then I assumed I could add gestures to it, but I just wouldn't. I wasn't able to figure it out. It sounds cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I want it to be cool, yeah? Number one requirement, it being cool. For now, unfortunately, we have this prompt. So that to test the logic works, you know? Yeah, like the promotion promotes actually where it's supposed to. Well, it's already addicting. <laughs> Honestly, it's already addicting. I go here, they take a run. I go here, the pound takes, then it's not a mate. What's the solution to this problem? Just here, then. And then we, of course, want a hint button, which I completely ignored for now. Um. We'll tell you the first move and like how many moves maybe. Which we don't have yet because we only have two main five, so it's quite over. But yeah, I have a whole page of ideas, but I don't have the technical uh, skills to do that yet. Therefore, this is why we're doing this tutorial. Too. Yeah, we need to learn how to do all those things. And uh, one more annoying thing is this app. 
it looks nice on this phone, but it has to be adaptive layout, which is gonna be again in the next unit, kinda. So one other many things. Don't have enough skill for that. Thanks God I have Telmarch to help because he has the, the... I just ask him a question he's like, yeah, you do it like this. Well, I don't know in Kotlin, but maybe you have something like this. And I'm like, yeah, we do have Kotlin. He's like, yeah, so you use it and you do it like this. And I would spend weeks to answer the same problem. Like there was, it, it, it's similar to how I solved Sumeshug. It's like, I see this solution immediately and he's like, how do you do it? Well, I'm a professional player. And same t same thing, but for programming, he's like, "How do you know it?" Well, <laughs> I'm a professional programmer. Uh, specifically, we had problem with recomposition, which is something that basically Android does to like refresh the screen. And we had to use a trick to refresh the screen at one moment. And I googled the answer and I'm like trying to read it like, oh god, I have no idea what they're doing. And Telmarch is like, oh, okay, I see. You just took one second, I read it for one minute, you did one second and you... Magic. Like he's solving Sume in 15 in programming. At a glance, that's how it feels. Or we did the for loop like this before. Or element in collection name body. Do loop through this. Use for keyword followed by a pair. Opening and closing parentheses. Uh, do I have to read this? I know what it does. The variable before in isn't declared with valor var, it's assumed to be get on. Okay. You name it anything you want. If a list is given a plural name like planets, it's common to have singular. Yeah. It can be used as a temporary variable corresponding to the current element in the collection. The element at index 0 for the first. One is one. You see this action, print out planet name. Okay. It's gonna be this, right? Yeah. Let's go. Oh, interfere type string, but int was expected. Uh. Oh, it's just planet. Oh, because it's like item. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm, it works. Uh, run the code. Yeah. Add elements to the list. The ability to add, remove, and update elements to collections exclusive to classes that implement mutable. It's the Kotlin thing. Okay, so if you want to add and remove elements... Okay, so speaking of our app, I guess if we just show the kifu, that would be a list. But then if we play moves and like modify the list by adding variations, for example, we have this app where you can input your own kifu and they save it, that has to be a mutable list. Because the size will change, right? <clears throat> there are two versions of add function. The first add function has a single parameter, single parameter of the type of element in the list, and it adds it at the end. And the other version has two parameters, index and which element. So if we just make a straightforward key for we're gonna use the first add, but if we have a variant 
in the Kifu, we're gonna use the second one to indicate where the variant starts. Yeah. Let's see both in action. Change the initialization of solar system to commutable list of the list of. You can now you have access to them. Again, you will want to classify Pluto as a planet. Add methods on set. Some scientists prioritize a planet called Thea. It used to exist before colliding with Earth and forming the Moon. Insert Thea, index 3, between Earth and Mars. Okay. Update spec element at a specific index. You can update existing element the future <laughs> with a subscreen index. Future Moon. Okay. So we're gonna update Thea into Future Moon. And then print the indexes free and map. Okay. So we have future moon and Pluto because that's a number three and number nine, and then we just printed out the rest. And it includes the future moon and Pluto as well. So we modified an item, we added an item on specific position, and at the end, Cool. So unlike the get thing, so getter would only get, those brackets also modify. I guess that's the difference between the get, get method and this method as well. Remove element. Oh, we have the remove. Okay. Elements are removed using remove or removed add method. You can either remove an element by passing into the remove method. Yeah, okay. So let's remove Pluto. <gasps> no! Okay. All remove on solar system passing the future moon. Uh, this should reach. Okay, so this is the index, and this one will be specifically. What do you want to remove? So you can do both. This provides contains methods that returns a boolean. If an element exists in the list, then the result contains. An even more consistent syntax is to use the in operator. You can check if an element is in the list using the element in operator collection. Use in operator check if contains, solar system contains. Okay, so those are two ways of doing the same thing. Let's see if it works for now. So we added feature moon, but then we delete it and it's false. So um, remove it. What did we learn? We have two ways to add something and third way as well, because it's an array. Then we remove add index or remove an actual named item. Or I guess object. In case it would be an object or whatever. And then we can check if the list contains something by doing list contains something or simply the another syntax. Like, is item in solar system? And this returns something. That's cool. Which is very similar to this, which is very confusing actually. But kind of makes sense because for every planet in solar system, for future mean in solar system. Sets. A set is a collection that does not have specific order and doesn't allow duplicate. Would that be useful in Shogia? I mean, if we had set of achievements, unless they don't need order, would they need order? No, that would be map actually. Oh, but it doesn't allow duplicate values. That could be useful for loading Tsume from a server or something. That it doesn't duplicate the Tsume that you downloaded. So yeah, yeah, it could be. How is a collection like this possible? 
Why is this music more loud than the others? <clears throat> the secret is a hash code. A hash code is an int produced by the hash code methods of any coding. An int, okay? It can be thought of a semi unique identifier for a Kotlin project. Object. Semi unique. Semi unique. <laughs> That's a weird word. A small change to the object, such as adding one character to a string, results in a vastly different hash value. But it's impossible for two objects. Why well, it's possible for two objects to have the same hash code called a hash collision? The hash code function ensures some degree of uniqueness, where most of the time two different values have a unique hash code. It sounds like. <laughs> Sometimes an error may happen because they're unique, but sure, let's go with it. Hash code, Kotlin hash code is different in it. A set uses hash codes as array index. Of course, there can be about 4 billion different hash codes, so a set isn't just one giant array. Instead, you can think of set as an array of lists. Oh god. Okay, outer array. Hash codes turn into array indicates. Okay, so we have hash codes, and then most of the lists have one element, and then sometimes they have the same hash code. Okay. The outer array, the number of lines in the blue on the left, each correspond to a range, also known as a bucket of possible hash code. Okay, bucket. Each binary list shadowed in green on the right represents the individual item in the set. Since hash collisions are relatively uncommon when even when potential indices are limited, the inner list uh, will have one or two items unless tens of thousands of tens of hundreds of thousands of elements are added. Yeah, so sometimes it may happen, okay? It is easier implementation than they are storing lists. Huh? In the easier implementation, they are storing lists of objects under one hash. So there won't be an error. But it's fast thanks to the fact the hashes are semi. Okay. I guess we don't care like 100% that they're unique, but also we do care. Like, kind of weird. Sets have two important properties. Searching for a specific element in set is, up, is fast compared with the list, especially for large collections. That reminds me of a map for some reason. We will learn the difference. Searching for a specific element in set is fast compared with lists, especially for large collections, while the index of lists requires checking each element from the beginning until the match is found. On average, it takes the same amount of time if it, to check if an element is in set. Whenever it's the first element or 100,000. So basically... It's easier to find stuff. Faster to find stuff. So we, we, if we have a lot of data and we want to find it fast, And we don't want to order them, yeah. <laughs> so, if you have a list of shaggy players, you just want to find the guy who didn't care about alphabetical order. I don't know. <laughs> mm. Set tends to use more memory than lists for the same amount of data, since more array indicates are often needed than data in the set. Indices. Are often needed than this. Sets. Of index. Oh, I see. 
<clears throat> okay, yeah, because they have a lot of hashes, so whatever, yeah. Contrary to popular belief, the time it takes to check if a set contains element is not fixed and does in fact depend on the amount of data in it. However, as there is there will be usually few hash collisions, the number of elements that need to be checked is still orders of magnitude smaller than searching an item for a list. Okay. Yeah, but here it seems similar, like you have the hash number and then you have items though. So. I just cannot imagine how is it different from one of watch. They won't stop kicking me. <laughs> uh, I got kicked. Okay. Okay. I mean, gonna figure it out later. The benefit of set is ensuring uniqueness. If you are writing a program to keep track of newly discovered planets, a set provides a simple way to check if a planet has already been discovered. With large amounts of data, this is often preferred to checking if element exists in list, which requires iteration over well, all the data. Okay. Still, I don't know how exactly it's doing that, but... Unless it generates a cache tag which is unique. Because the name translates to that hash, yeah, I guess. Like lists and mutable lists, there is both set and mutable set. Mutable sets implement sets. Any class implementing mutable set needs to implement both. Set, mutable set, linked hash set. Okay. Use mutable in Kotlin. Okay, finally. Remove the existing code in main. Bloop. Create a set of plants called solar system using mutable set. Present mutable set. Mutable set of the default implementation of which is linked hashtag hash set. Okay. Linked hash set. I should write it now. Linked. Set is default implementation of mutable set. And then um, print the size. Can we print the size of a set? Eight. Go. Cool. Like this set has some other methods. Okay. It only takes a single parameter for the element being added. Elements in sets don't necessarily have an order. So there's no index. Oop. Okay, we added it. Print. Oop. Nine. The contains function takes a single parameter, it checks if the specified element is in set. If it returns true, otherwise it is. But they're not telling us to print the set. I wonder if it will be random uh, order. Alternatively, you can use in operator to check if the element is in the collection. Put all uh, system contains. Put. Ah, Pluto in solar system. Okay. Uh, as mentioned before, sets can contain duplicates. Okay. Okay, now this is the exciting part. We're gonna try to add Pluto and check the size. It was 9. And it's gonna be cell 9. Hmm, that's interesting. And then remove the Pluto. Remember, the sets are in ordered collection. There is no way to remove value by index because they don't have indices. Print the size of the collection and check if it's still in the. Okay, but what if I were to print it? The whole thing. Or planet in. So. 
Art system print seven planet like this. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus. I guess because we added it in that order. That was it. In that order. Kotlin, this looks so intuitive and easy. I haven't tried coding for like 20 years. C++ is very slow. And muffin boring. Yep, yeah, I did C++ and uh, Java in school, but university. But so far Kotlin seems to be a lot of fun, so recommend it. I mean, those are simple concepts, but there is more that looks intuitive. A map is a collection consisting of key and values. Okay, so the sets were unique. Yeah, that's what we refreshed of our memory. It doesn't have index. Lists had index and order to them. I guess the order is because they have index, yeah? Sure. <laughs> Not sure. I guess because they have index, they have order, yeah? How long has been this language been used and do you think it will have continued wide adoption? That's a question to some uh, professional programmers, which I am not. But it seems, according to what I saw in my amateur league, it's being more and more used. And I also understand that it's uh, not so old, it's actually a new language. But yeah, do not count on my opinion. <laughs> so far for me it's fun. And if it's fun, it's probably good. <laughs> a map is a collection consisting of keys and values. It's called a map because unique keys are mapped to other values. A key and a component value are often called key pair value. Value pair. We have key planets and value moons. Yeah. Thank you for the follow, Froggy. My husband might be able to answer that question once, but he's not here yet. Not here now because he's working. But <laughs> I think he said it looks nice and it's getting more popular. That was, I think, what he said as well. He's a mainly Java programmer, so. And he as a mainly Java programmer like the way Kotlin looks if it's telling. Uh, map keys are unique. Keys are unique. Map values are not. Yeah, okay. Two different keys could map to the same value. Oh. Two different keys. Oh, yeah, okay. For example, Mercury has zero moons and Venus has zero moons. Okay. Accessing a value from a map it by its keys generally faster than searching through a large list, such as index of. Okay. Maps can be declared using map of or mutable map. Maps require two generic types separated by comma. One for keys and one for the value. Keys. A map can use type in the can also use type interface inter inference. If it has uh, initial values. Okay. The populate map with initial values, each key value pair consists of key followed by two operator followed by the value. Key to value. Name map. Okay. So we don't have to state the type. Yeah, if we do. So we have keys that are unique, values that are not, and it understands that it's string to int by default, I guess. Rock says, I think Kotlin will be used since it's one of two languages that Android supports, right? Yeah, I, I think one of two. Is it one of two? What's the other one, Java? 
this is like this XML, which I don't know if it's considered one of the languages. Uh, and it seems like more readable and user friendly than Java. Okay, you say the Java is the second support. Yeah. Yeah, it seems pleasant, and programming is supposed to be pleasant, right? It will probably have its own problems the more people make with it, but... For me, like a programmer who comes back after years back to programming, it seems very intuitive. Is there an App Store program that you could use? Uh, for what? For programming? Uh, iPads don't run on Android, right? As well. This is Android, yeah? Uh, so, uh, I don't know. There's Android Studio on my computer. Um, and it's called... There's something called Jetpack Compose, specifically, that I'm learning. I guess there's a like Kotlin and there's Jetpack Compose, which is specific type of Kotlin. I don't know how to describe it, but it deals with how you refresh the screen rather than coding. That's my understanding of it. Like it has those Compose elements that determines the UI look. I mean, if you want to just try it out, there's those playground things. Why would you program on a phone? I don't know. <laughs> Hotlin programming compiler. I guess there is something like this. This compiles Kotlin scripts on web compiler. Yeah, I guess you could use that then. I mean, I guess. Yeah, I didn't know. I don't have an iPad right now. I used to have, but... I mean, I, I wouldn't program on a mobile phone either, because it seems like very tiny and everything, but if, if you like it... I, I prefer, like, this. that's what I'm using, yeah. Um, Android Studio. Yes, I, I don't know if you know that it can simulate that you have a phone. Like it can run your app on that fake phone. Loading. <laughs> and then you can click on it and do stuff. Yeah. It's interactive. You don't need an actual phone. Yeah, that's what I'm using. Android Studio, yeah. Like I code here. I see my preview over here. And then I test it on the phone and I test it on my actual uh, Google Pixel. But because I don't know how lists work, <laughs> I'm learning. Or the maps, I guess, in this case. Let's take a closer look how to use maps and some useful properties. Create a map, which we did. The same code, yeah. Like lists and set map provides size. So we will know how many moves in our Shogi apps Kifo has, for example. You can use subscript syntax to set additional key values. Set Pluto key with value 5. So we don't have Pluto key, but by putting Pluto, we add it with a new key, okay? And check the size again. 
So we should have nine. Okay. You can use subscripts index to get a value. Okay, print the number of moons. Okay. Good. A number of moons. Five. Which is correct. You can also have access values with the get method whenever you use simstax. Call get, it's possible that the queue pass isn't in the map. If there is isn't in the key value pair, it will let her know. So for example, we're trying to print there. But it's gonna say null because it doesn't exist in our map. The remove methods remove the key very well. Remove Pluto. Print solar size, which should be back to 8. Yep. And then subscript screen or the put method can also modify a value key for a key that already exists. So we can change one of the moons of Pluto exploded so now it's gonna have 78 cool. all right yeah so this android studio is for pc i'm on pc right now oh uh, sorry i didn't make it clear yeah this is pc congratulations you learn about one of the most foundational foundational it's a word I didn't know existed. Foundational uh, data types in programming, the array, and several convenient collection types built of arrays, including list set map. These collection types allow you to group and organize values in your code. Arrays and lists provide fast access to elements by their index. While sets maps use hash codes to make clear to find elements in the collection. You will see these collection types is frequently in future apps. Using knowing them is good. List set map array. So map is key value. Set is no duplicates. Uh, list is order. Yeah. Indexed. I mean, map also cannot have duplicates. Kind of confusing, but map needs two things to remember. Set doesn't need just one thing, right? And it gives it a hash. I guess that's good. Array stay the same type data. Use the implement, resize. Lists are resizable. Okay, resizable. Can contain duplicates and there's pairs of key and value. So, key value in map. Oh, that's useful as well. Is there a move on the position free? Yeah, that, that could be useful as well. Refresh everything. Give me my checks. Android developers, give me my check. Where is my check? It's not here yet. Okay, whatever. Um, I dare order function to. What's exciting, like after doing it all, ooh, you can do a lot of stuff. Ooh. Ooh. After that, practice and quiz. Yeah, we'll have to do those, <laughs> but practice classes and collections. Like, there's more those practical stuff that you do. Exciting. But after that, we're gonna build a scrabble list, which is more practical. And it's gonna be... One step closer to navigation, which is so important for us. 
But um, I'm gonna finish for now, guys. Yes, it is lunchtime. You don't want me hungry. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. I'm gonna just throw the link to the Discord. We do shoggy stuff usually there. Uh, but uh, this is the project I've been working on as well. Uh, in the Play Shoggy Projects channel. If you're interested, you can join. Thank you for giving all the hints, especially Rogue. Yeah. And I will see you with more Shoggy content on the weekend. Maybe more programming next week. Should we raid someone? Somebody's streaming Shoggy right now. There's some Japanese people streaming Shaggy, but I doubt that people can understand Japanese, eh? Oh well. I will see you guys then. Take care and have a nice uh, Thursday, yeah? Bye bye!